two of this conversation. And so I'm guessing what we're getting people coming around to listen to part two are real, <clears throat> real MI geeks like us that like to talk about this stuff. Um, <laughs> and um, we're really looking forward to everybody's thoughts, ideas, and questions, and we'll try to get around to them as much as we can. And there's there's big David Rosengren. Hello, Dave. <laughs> this is the sequel with a mostly new cast of characters. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. A few stars that were brought on from the first. It carried me over from the last series. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, let, let's get started. I think uh, we got 90 minutes, so let's get rolling. You want to roll? I like the way Bill likes, just takes charge. My favorite story of you, Bill, what Chris told me one time is you, there was a mint forum somewhere and you were walk, there's a group of people looking for a place to eat and you pointed at something and said, well, there's a restaurant. <laughs> so just a very practical sort of thing. All right, so <laughs> welcome everybody. All right, let's go ahead and get going. We got 90 minutes, so let's, let, let's have a conversation. So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good day to everybody. Um, I'm Joel Porter. I'm here with um, Ange, and uh, Steve sends his apologies. He's on holiday um, at this period of time, but I'm sure he will be um, have some thoughts next month about what we've been talking about the last couple of months. Um, so welcome. Welcome to our webinar. We're glad you're taking the time to be here, um, and we have, a, we have a wonderful group of friends here at, to talk about this motivational interviewing theory idea. And so I'm looking forward to see where this conversation goes. Um, so I'm in Christchurch, New Zealand, and I think um, I'll pass it over to Ange to introduce herself. She runs the show here, and then we'll do a quick round of introductions. Hi, everyone. My name's Ange Watkins. I'm in Cardiff, Wales, and I provide tech support to the team. So really glad to be with you all today. I'll just call out names, Chris. Hi everyone, Chris Wagner coming to you from Richmond, Virginia, United States. Uh, just back from uh, a month and a half in Albania on the Mediterranean with my wife's family and feeling really relaxed and excited about uh, talking today. Uh, Paul. Hi, uh, I'm Paul Earnshaw. I'm based in Manchester, England. Um, I, my background's in uh, psychological therapy, but also more recently, more research and, uh, and I'm a MI trainer. Um, I'm just emerging out of two weeks of COVID. Uh, so if I'm a little bit fuzzy, um, that's probably why. Uh, I looked at the uh, first episode uh, uh, of this today and I thought, what am I getting myself into? This looks really interesting. Uh, it's really, really quite challenging stuff. <laughs> <this one. laughs> And Molly. Hi, everyone. I'm Molly McGill. I'm an associate professor. Um, I'm located in, uh, I'm at Brown University, and I'm located in Rhode Island in the United States. And I'm definitely very excited to be here for part two. I loved part one, and I've been enjoying this podcast as I've been introduced to it relatively recently, and, and it's a good time. Fantastic. Alan. Hi, Alan Zukoff, Red Bank, New Jersey, at the northern tip of the beautiful Jersey Shore. And uh, back from part one, which was, for those of you who uh, watched it, was a lively conversation that we ended in a number of us, both inside and outside the podcast, felt like, wow, there's a lot more to be said. Felt like we were really just getting started in some of this. And so I was very very pleased when uh, when when Joel and Steve decided let's let's do a part two. So happy to be here. And Bill, um, Bill Miller. I'm at home in Albuquerque. I'm an unemployed writer uh, with a with some interest in motivational interviewing. Done a bit of research here and there, and I look forward to talking about theory. Uh, that's an occupation you've been longing for for a long time. Indeed. Life. It's I recommend it. Well, okay, well, all right. Well, let's go ahead and get going. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to have a conversation, and we're going to—I don't know—we're going to pick up where we left off or what. But we have some 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 things that people have been thinking about, and um, Alan's going to kick it off. 
Thank you, Joel. Uh, so I'm not going to try to summarize the conversation from the last time. That would be too much to do. And I think uh, I'm sure many of those threads will be woven back in over the next uh, almost 90 minutes. Uh, let me just start this way. Fundamentally, research tells us what happens and theory tells us why it happens. And MI has obviously a rich, varied and really impressive uh, store of research that has looked at not just the efficacy and effectiveness, but questions about the, uh, the processes that are going on in MI and how those processes combine or interact or have particular effects. Um, and the question of the why, however, I think has been left less developed and less discussed. Uh, the, the question of why is, of course, not a question that you can answer at a, sing, at, at a single level. Uh, so, for example, you can say, well, why did MI have an impact in this study? Why did it lead to behavior change? And you might be able to say from process research, well, there were a, a lot of affirmations in the uh, or reflections in those who changed and in those who didn't change, there were many fewer. And so it seems like MI worked because at least in part, there was a lot of affirming and reflecting or between there was lots of affirming and reflecting uh, in, the, in the MI condition and very much less of that in the non-MI condition. And therefore we can, we can say something about the why. To me, the interesting, the more interesting question, I suppose, is why would reflective listening lead to change? Why? We, we say acceptance facilitates change, right? That's what Rogers taught us. And it's a core understanding that, that lies at the heart of MI. Uh, and that when people feel not expected to change, they're more likely to resist or, or to be less likely to change. Why? Why should it be? What kind of beings are we? What kind of creatures are we? Mm -hmm. Such that when we feel fully accepted as we are by another person, say, we become more motivated to change who we are, to become better, to become different, to grow. Why does it matter that, why, why is it that affirmation, someone conveying a positive view or prizing us, should result in, again, our uh, uh, increased likelihood to change behavior among other effects? Those that to me, those are the kind of questions that theory should be trying to answer. And what I think we have in MI currently are lots of theories that support the use of different elements of MI or that give account of certain parts of MI. So we have reactance theory that suggests that uh, the reason why it's not a good idea to prompt discord is that people will will tell people what to do is that they will try to defend their freedom to to control their own behavior and and so on so we have reactance theory we have self-perception theory uh, we have references to rogers and, and to the humanistic theory of of uh relating and numerous other theories as well the problem i think is that these theories don't cohere and in some cases, they're, they're incompossible. That is, it can't both be true that we cultivate change talk and it leads to change because of, it, that, that, that that's explained by self-perception theory, which is a radical behaviorist theoretical account challenge to cognitive dissonance theory of 
why people learn from listening to themselves. That can't be true at the same time as it's true that we are uh, influenced, uh, that, that, that we have a natural tendency towards growth and that we pursue our own telos because behaviorism and Rogerian humanistic theory are incompossible. Yes, I did. Incom it's not a new word, but it is a, it's a good word. They cannot exist together. One or the other of those two things must be true, or neither is exactly true. And we need to find a synthesis that actually maybe captures some of what both are saying. But I think there is value in our trying to think through these kinds of questions of what is really going on when we're doing MI. Why does MI work when it works? Why do the thing? Why do we teach people to do what we tell them to do when we're teaching them MI? How does that fit together? And does that make predictions? Does that theory allow us to predict anything that we can then test and further refine that theory or disconfirm that theory? And, uh, and as long as we're all speaking different theoretical languages, we've got the self-determination people, we've got the Rogerians and the humanists, we've got, the, uh, uh, we've got people arguing for cognitive dissonance theory, we've got as long as we have multiple competing theoretical perspectives and no common theory language, I think in some ways we miss opportunities to really get a deeper understanding of how MI works and why it works. And also, most importantly, be able to use that understanding to be to figure out how do we do MI better and how do we teach MI more effectively. So that's my investment in this conversation. And so I'll stop there and really interested to see what others might think of some of this. All right. Somebody want to jump in? I, I will. I mean, I, I, I love you, Alan, and I, I appreciate theory. I am by uh, just my own preferences more of a scientist than a theoretician. I've never been that interested in generating theory, but I'm interested in reading it. and. For the very reason that you suggest, if it tells us something that we can test that we didn't know before, uh, yes, of course. And I'm happy that other people are, are thinking about this. I, I think we've done very well without a theory in motivational interviewing. Uh, it, I mean, fascinating things have happened. And I don't think there is an organizing theory behind it. We've, we've kind of linked several in as I did even in the very first article of, well, it kind of sounds like cognitive dissonance or it kind of sounds like self-perception theory. Um, but science really starts with careful observation. And we're, we're really good at that. I mean, we've, we've done well observing practice and trying to figure out what's going on. And that's exactly where Carl Rogers started as well. Uh, he wound up spinning a pretty elaborate theory that I don't think has had a lot of impact on the practice of person-centered uh, therapy. In fact, the, the whole Truex and Karkoff book, which is strong process stuff, doesn't even mention Rogers' theory. Uh, they, they were just interested in what, what makes therapy more effective. The same kind of scratching your head, observing, trying to figure it out, without really going too far into the theory ends. So they're, they're complementary things to me. But careful observation, yes. Hypotheses that are testable, yes. And we've got plenty of those in motivational interviewing also. And observation is the original meaning of empirical. That, what is the experience that you're trying to organize here? Uh, and theory is built from replicable hypotheses. So we've got a good foundation to, for people who are interested in developing theory. We're not short of theories that, that uh, seek to explain motivational interviewing. As Alan said, we've got uh, behavior analytic perspectives, radical behavior analytic, uh, orthogonal interaction, self-determination theory, evolutionary psychology, Carl Rogers' own perspective, which could be a theoretical uh, understanding of what's happening. I suggested self-perception theory and cognitive dissonance, and Gary Rose and I put together something kind of like a theory or at least testable hypotheses around change talk and sustained talk and talked about relational and technical aspects of MI. So, so all of these are kind of seeking to explain in a way why MI works. 
Now, to me, the test of a useful theory is it tells us something we didn't already know. Uh, and they suggest what places to look where we haven't looked. And, and that's a useful thing too. Uh, they can suggest new testable hypotheses that we haven't tested yet. Um, so far, I don't personally know of a theory that has caused us to discover something about MI that we didn't already know. Uh, and, and so that's for me where, where theory gets interesting. When it suggests something we haven't really thought about before and you test it and by golly, that seemed to be true. Now, some of you may well disagree with me about that, but just as I was thinking about it, what, what theory has told us something that we didn't already know from experience? Uh, and that's where I start to get excited about things. Because I think mostly these theories have just given different names to aspects of experience um, and are working primarily in the context of discovery and we haven't gotten too far into the context of justification where you can do hypothetical deductive thinking and come up with something, oh, let's look at that and uh, see something that we, that we hadn't really seen before. Um, I don't see a reason why we have to have an organized theory behind motivational interviewing. There are certainly researchers who wish that we would uh, and are frustrated that the definition keeps changing and evolving over time. Uh, that's just the kind of animal that motivation living has been. I also am aware that, it, that if you get too locked into a theory, it can be blinkers. It can you know, cause you to focus on certain things and not see things in the periphery that are going on that are also quite important. So just in terms of, of philosophy of science, I think induction, abduction, and deduction can all work together. They all center around hypotheses. Uh, and I don't think we yet have a single theory, and we may never have a single theory that really guides and organizes what we do. But I'm interested in that level of thinking about why is, here's what we're seeing pretty consistently. Why is that happening? That's an interesting question. And there seem to be lots of potential answers. So that's kind of dust bowl empiricist. That's kind of where I am with, uh, with all of this. I can go next. Go ahead, Molly. Yeah. Okay. Um, I I might have a, a, a similar um, perspective in the sense that when I first heard the topic for this for for the last session, it was like, is there a theory of motivational interviewing? I was like, <laughs> there's a theory of motivational interviewing. And maybe I didn't totally understand the question in the sense that it seems like the finer point of the question is, is there a singular theory or a singular framework as opposed to multiple theories, um, as, as Bill discussed and as, as Alan discussed in terms of, you know, separate theories or explanations to explain various phenomena, both in relation to effectiveness and relation to process, sort of the why. Why is something effective? Um, for me, I don't mind having multiple multiple lenses or ways to look at different aspects of phenomenon as a someone who tests theory for a living. Um, I and and actually runs the analyses to test those theories. I know that there is no data set large enough um, or right enough to test a singular theory. So breaking up theories into different parts is is um, pragmatic and reasonable to me. Um, when I, I also just wanna think about like how I teach motivational interviewing or how I understand, motive, how I explain the why of it. And I, you know, I start with um, harm reduction. There are, you know, more than just abstinence is, can be a goal. I think about the trans theoretical model and the idea of matching treatment to a person's stage of change. I think about Rogers and the idea that both optimism and acceptance must be genuine and that that is an absolute journey for the therapist, or at least it may be, depending on where the therapist begins in their personality, that those two things are actually like huge feats um, and hugely important foundations to motivational interviewing being effective. I do think about self-perception theory, and maybe I don't even know the theory that well, because all my shorthand for it is language creates reality. Um, 
later I hit discrepancy and cognitive dissonance and I talk about the technical and the relational hypothesis. Um, and I'm very comfortable <laughs> with like all of those different things. And I know mm -hmm. that it is changing. And so sometimes I do get mad about it changing, um, but, but I do see it as adding you know, I do see um, the evolution as adding further perspective and further refinement. And I almost, I actually want to add a couple other things, which is, and one came from this podcast. Um, I think something that hasn't maybe been articulated yet is this idea of motivational interviewing as a way to further therapist self-regulation. I'm not aware of a paper that has really fleshed that out and you know talked about what that means and um, what the theory behind what that means is. Um, but it, you know, I've thought a lot about it. It just hearing it from this podcast and the idea of the role of the therapist's ego and how it influences what they, you know, how they are in a session, um, and also how motivational interviewing has changed how I hear words and particularly words related to pathology or ways to frame human suffering, behavior change, et cetera. And I feel like our whole society is reckoning with language right now. And so that's, I think, a second like kind of unarticulated piece of how am I maybe changes how we hear. So yeah, just to totally complicate the conversation more. We're now adding to the theory as part of today's discussion. That's exactly what we want to do, Molly. Complicate it as much as possible and then see what we can make <laughs> Somebody who does like to call, Paul, you, you ready to go? Well, yeah, maybe uh, hop in on complexity because, uh, I mean, as I said, watching the, the previous episode, uh, but also, um, my my own recent experience about developing an interest in MI theory has really been about uh, looking at uh, integration with MI with CBT and some writing I've done about that and also some research that I did with people who were experts in that area, both in practice and in terms of running trials, and really asking them what they thought were the underlying mechanisms or what were the best bets on, uh, on theory. And I think in that process for me, um, I, uh, I mean, I do, I, I think I have a similar answer to the question about do we need a theory to Alan, but I think uh, certainly I, I felt that uh, identifying a number of limitations in MI theory, I mean, I think Bill has, and Steve have purposely stayed away from developing it as a comprehensive uh, theory of, of, of motivation, and probably for very good reasons, I think. Um, and I think uh, it, I think the more you study theory, the more you get into it. I think the more you think, well, yeah, this is a good idea. I think um, maybe we could do with a theory that is pulling together lots of different theories that have already been talked about. Uh, and that will help us answer those why questions. You know, why does MI work? Why do certain uh, theories or hypotheses within MI about what we do in MI, why does that work? Who does it work for? In what circumstances does it work for? And I think for me, that's one of the things that I've I've really looked at is thinking about contextualizing our insights into why MI works. Um, I think a lot of the research that, that's been done is fantastic, has revealed a great deal, but I think it has tended to be, um, I suppose, very, very individualized, but at the same time, not really service user centered. I don't think there's been a great deal of asking of recipients of MI why they think it's working. And I think one thing, you know, there are lots of different things, and I'm sure Molly's got ideas about how you can test these out or whether you can't, but as a relational social intervention, um, I think we're interested in what is going on between people in that interaction. And I think one of the philosophical uh, positions that I looked in was really thinking about how we understand mechanisms of action. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion between what people understand as mechanisms, what they describe as models, what they describe as theories. And I think I'm with Alan on this, is that I think if we are studying mechanisms of action, then that does give us some uh, opportunity to then test that out in practice in some way, 
and in that process develop theory. Uh, so I don't think developing theory is a, a bad idea. Um, I think for some people, it's just not their thing. They don't want to do it. They're quite happy it works. They know it works. But if you like, we've known for some time now that MI works. We've done any number of outcome studies that seem to suggest it works. Um, and we've been thinking about why it works, but maybe it's worth continuing doing that and actually delving deeper into why MI works and whether there are kind of core concepts that, there are, that we can pull together from different theories and think about if that gives us a better explanation that we can then test out uh, in, in further research and in practice. That would be my initial thoughts. There's so much to react to. I don't even know where to start. I, I'm, I'm really resonating the moment to that, you know, idea of I'd, I'd really love to see a swing from outcomes research to process and process outcomes research being the kind of primary focus going forward. And there's lots of external funding reasons that maybe hasn't happened or is going to be difficult to happen. But I do think uh, just following on Paul and Molly in particular, that we'd learn a lot if we would, you know, have a lot more research on what's happening you know, and what are the effects of what's happening in the moment and for whom and, you know, et cetera. Um, backing up a bit, I, I watched the last uh, webcast. I really enjoyed and appreciated that and the give and take uh, between people on it. Uh, the main takeaways for me were that there are, I really resonated with the idea that there are multiple potential explanatory levels that you could look at what's going in and am I at these different levels and that I, I'm still turning around what Alan said, maybe they conflict with each other, but maybe they're on different levels and, and you know, there are different ways of explaining things depending on whether you're talking, what's going on uh, phenomenologically for someone, what's going on biologically for them, what's going on interpersonally. Um, and the other main thing I took away was, I think from Kathy said, am I the bit like a magpie bringing home the shiny bits of things from various places? And, you know, I like that feel about am I, that it's kind of like this going out and gathering things that seem to be, seem to make sense in the context of what we're trying to do working with people and seem to be useful and not getting too caught up in like the necessarily all the larger structures that the bits come from. I think that's been something I've liked about MI from my first exposure to it. Um, I'll say I don't think of MI as a thing. I think of motivational interviewing as a kind of a mix of a way of being with others, collection of strategies and techniques that um, I'd say are modestly affiliated with various traditions, with evidence, um, with a mix of suppositions and propositions and hypotheses. And, you know, the, the shape to me of, of MI is a bit amorphous. The borders are kind of porous. Um, but there, for the most part, there's something recognizable about MI in different people's hands. Um, I would say it, 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 to me, MI broadens out to being kind of a family of approaches rather than being one specific thing. And it, in the hands of different researchers or different helpers in different settings and cultures, working with people on kind of different issues or different aspects of their being or their lives. Um, the, the, again, I would say a family of approaches that are overlapping, but not identical. You know, what we see in a, a single session research study around a health behavior, that's MI. Um, the only bits and pieces of what's in the MI3 book or the MI4 book to come. Um, and I, you know, I'm really interested in this idea of um, trying to productively view MI through multiple lenses and kind of see how that's helpful. Because I think that it can be really helpful to practitioners in the moment trying to figure out this puzzle that's in front of me, which pieces should I pay attention to? Um, you can read the entire MI4 book. And you can know all the pieces, but knowing in a moment kind of which one to focus in on 
is something that theory or, or conceptualization could help with. Um, administrators trying to implement you know, MI in specific settings for specific purposes can benefit from theory. Researchers to kind of pick the most important parts for their little bit of time they might have to work with uh, patients or clients. Um, and something I've been interested in a long time, I think since the Fest Schrift for Bill back in 2006 in Miami that Alan had hosted is, is theory or at least conceptual understanding as a basis for future development of MI. And at some point, um, you know, we won't necessarily have Bill and Steve telling us this is MI and this isn't MI. And I think we all trust Terry to kind of take the next level, Terry Moyers. But at some point, I, I want to see a set, kind of set of guardrails around what are the elements that can be MI and what is kind of outside of that so that it doesn't just end up this battle of will, of, you know, or it doesn't get frozen in time of the last thing that one of the initial developers wrote about MI is then that forever, which we've seen happen with, with various approaches. So you know, I was thinking about like you could you could look at MI phenomenologically, you know, we're helping somebody relax and become less defensive or genuine, look inside themselves, you know, and see themselves in a positive light find greater autonomy and agency, um, maybe inhabit the role of author of their own life and start writing the next chapter. So this is a, a kind of lens you could look at MI through, kind of what's, what's the experience part of it for a person. Um, interpersonally, the half of the interpersonal theory that uh, initially attracted me to MI was talked about last week in the, in the uh, talking about hierarchy and power and control mechanism. So interpersonal theories, you know, suggest that interpersonal interactions um, are negotiated around dimensions of control. So dominance to submission and affiliation, warmth to coldness or, you know, community to individualism or, you know, kind of the feeling tone. And you can look at MI interpersonally as taking kind of a one down warm Friendly, what we call friendly submissive position, but an agreeable position with clients that aligns with, you know, empathy and compassion and non-intrusive warmth. And that theoretically what that should do is draw out of clients um, more open, hopeful, extroverted, gregarious kind of ways of being and thinking um, that are kind of align with self-confidence. You could kind of go through the different levels, phenomenological, interpersonal, Biological, that was talked about a lot last week with the brain system. So we'll go back into that. But you know, even if you didn't do that biologically, if you look at trauma-informed treatment and the idea of creating safety to allow people, you know, um, the experience of having the nervous system just get tuned down a bit so they can open up. It's another way to look at it. You can look at emotions. Um, whether it's you know, resolving the tension between to negative emotions or finding inspiration or hope or confidence about changing. And you can look at MI through that. Or of course, through the humanistic approach that it's unblocking a, a kind of um, self-actualization tendency that's already there and just help that what MI specifically does then is help channel that after it's unblocked into, you know, toward a specific change. Um, there's, and then there's all the other theories people talk about. And I guess my argument would be, I, I would like to keep this family of theories. Um, I would like us to stay open to all of them and kind of looking at things through these different levels because I think at different places and times, different theories are going to be helpful to us. So that was a lot. Sorry, but I got going. So could I pick up on, could I kind of continue the circle, so to speak, and, and maybe picking up on some of what, uh, what you were just ending with, Chris, but also with, with several of have been saying, um, and, and Bill, uh, I, I particularly uh, was struck by um, the point you made that a good theory is tells us something we didn't already know from experience. I think that, I think there's a there's that that's sort of a profound statement that I that I I want I, I, I just kind of been running through my my thoughts as we've been as been listening to everyone. 
And I guess I, I, I suppose I want to maybe raise a concrete question about uh, whether whether the theory we choose, like the, as, as Chris was just saying at the end, the humanistic theory about unblocking potential versus a theory that has more to do with submissiveness uh, versus dominance versus a theory that has more to do with shaping language, uh, whether that matters. You know, ultimately, does it tell us anything we didn't already know if we sort of ask, can we ask questions that would tell us this is a better theoretical account for why am I works or when am I works than this is. And, and I don't know that we, I don't think we have that yet. I think, we, and I think to me, that's one of the areas of research that would be most interesting. Um, so just take one example and then, and then uh, is autonomy support versus influence. But to, and, it, and I said versus, and of course, everyone is immediately thinking, well, it's not versus, it's both and, right? I mean, that's sort of the secret sauce of MI, that it's that somehow we do both of those seemingly incompossible or incompatible things. Um, you know, per person-centered and directive, right from the beginning, MI sort of thrived on paradox. Um, the question for me is, is it possible to test or to determine whether at certain moments or under certain circumstances there would be more impact from strongly focusing on supporting and emphasizing client autonomy than in uh, thinking in terms of influencing the client to move in a particular direction through the selective reflection and elaboration of the change talk we've heard. Um, I talked about this a little bit all the way back in, in, in 2017 at ICMI in Philly. Um, the, the distinction that got made in MI in Mighty Three that doesn't exist anymore when it was a global between a four and a five in autonomy support and how a four of, of autonomy support was recognizing and acknowledging the person's autonomy and a five was in some way deepening or strengthening the person's experience of being autonomous. Um, do, I think uh, Rogers, certainly Rogerian, Rogers theory of personality, certainly self-determination theory would very likely predict that you're gonna get more impact from really emphasizing what autonomy support at that five level. I think self-perception theory, behavior uh, analytic accounts might predict that, yes, you have to get, you, ha you need to be at least a four of autonomy. You don't wanna be doing anything that's gonna generate reactants, but that plus the cultivation of the reflection and elaboration of change talk, the shaping of language, that's actually gonna result in more change. I think those are two different predictions that those two theories would make about they're both MI, but sort of as Chris was saying, which family of MI, which, which, which sort of for emphasis of MI are, are, are really? Um, oh, look who's joining us! And uh, and and so that I think a question like that, or the other big question that I've had for years and years is self-esteem. Self-esteem appeared in the 1983 article. It sort of disappeared from MI not MI theory not long after. I think uh, Rogers would predict that since the need for positive regard is a core human need, that anything we do in MI that has the impact, that, that's more affirming, positive regard focused, and therefore self-esteem strengthening is more likely to lead to change. Whereas another theory might say, yeah, self-esteem, it's not really, it doesn't play that much of a role. So I think it's possible to begin to delineate some of the things we've learned about doing MI, the different pieces of it, and think about alternate theoretical accounts and ask questions, even in a controlled way, potentially, about which of these does a better job, which tells us more, because that's what we should be teaching. Mm -hmm. If one or the other, leads to better MI, more impact, then we really want to know that so we can help our students and our trainees and ourselves.
Well, hello, Steve. You just couldn't stay away. Hey. Glad you popped in to join us. Um, so I'm trying to think, right? I, I'm trying to think. I love that expression. Um, if there are the if there was a theory, right, Bill, if you and Steve were going to sit down and go, okay, chapter two, the theory of motivational interviewing, would that look a bit like a patchwork quilt with all these different things knitted neatly together and finding a place for everything? Um, or would, would it be what you see sometimes when people try to advance a theory that, that they, the error is to package it up and use words that weren't used before to explain the exact same thing, right? That's sort of like give a car a facelift. The car the car runs pretty good, but we're mm -hmm. just going to change the face of it just so we can say it's a new model. And 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 one of the things I've appreciated that from the very first um, edition of the book, and I remember profoundly the one of the things that stood out with me was how did you bring directional and non-directional things together? You know, that was that was a piece, that was a bridge that really kind of, um, you know, in my in my training and my reading, it was like those those two don't fit together. And I think as Chris and, and other folks have put out that MI has kind of been a bridge between incompossible um, theories and ideas and proven that yes, there is a, there is that sweet spot of a, of a, of a, of a, of, a, of, of, of yes, there is a middle ground for this. So I'm, I guess I'm wondering, what would that look like? Where would you begin mm -hmm. to come up with a theory? How would you start that process? And what would you, how would you frame it up? Well, obviously we've never written such a chapter, the yeah. theory of motivational interviewing. I, I, I like Molly's kind of, off the logic, off um, off the logic um, image of flipping lenses of, uh, and, and I find theories, different theories, useful in that way. Of just like when you go to the eye doctor, is this clear or is this clear? And which 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 of these brings it better into focus? And depending on the task, uh, you know, different things seem to fit. I mean, when when I first read Bill Neto's paper, paper I thought. This makes a lot of sense. I mean, this fits. It's another way of thinking about what we're doing that fits. It, it hasn't yet, I think, taught us something else to uh, uh, to test or realize. But there are all these different lenses that kind of make sense of it. And so I would be reluctant to try to put one forward, and it would kind of be a patchwork quilt. I mean, for myself, I think it started from self-regulation theory, which very very intrapsychic. But we've been enriched by the, all these interpersonal uh, and evolutionary psychology and linguistic uh, anthropology and all sorts of other perspectives that say, well, now there are other things going on here too. And I'm, I'm fascinated just by flipping the lenses and seeing what it teaches us. And does it suggest different things that we should be asking or trying or testing? So, Steve, do you have uh, an audio connection or? No, he doesn't. Okay, all right. Okay, you're just a passenger today. Yeah. He's non-directive um, today. Yeah. <laughs> Molly, what are you thinking? Well, I would just add something very briefly. Is the question of like, are we asking something of motivational interviewing that we don't ask of other theoretical models of intervention? So, aren't all specific modalities of treatment based on a kind of a patchwork theory or as you said Joel a you know a relabeling of of things that were used or that were repurposed from somewhere else mm. so I guess just to own, I don't think so you don't I, I think mean, so I think so I, I don't think example. we're asking yeah, so 
Rogerian person-centered theory. Mm -hmm. so Rogers has a theory of therapy and he has a personality theory, a theory of personality development and human being that are relatively seamlessly integrated. One flows very logically uh, uh, from the other. Uh, I thought Bill's earlier comment, and I, another one that I'm going to be thinking about for a while, that as far as he can tell, the, the personality theory hasn't had much influence on person-centered mm -hmm. practice, I think is a really interesting sort of observation. It, it did where I came from. So I was trained in, in the, the, this was the modality I was trained in at the graduate level. Um, and so for me, when I'm thinking about doing MI, I'm thinking about my, part of what I'm holding is this idea of the person I'm with as someone who is struggling with conditions of worth, who's, who, is, who has, because they have in, internalized conditions of worth, mistrust themselves, do not, uh, do not feel they can allow themselves to pursue what is, would spontaneously or organismically, as Rogers would say, would emerge from them, but rather they must shape their behavior and even not be aware of wanting certain things or feeling certain ways, because if they allow themselves to pursue this or they allow themselves to know it, those conditions of worth that they've integrated will leave them feeling anxious or, 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 or self-loathing. So part of what I'm thinking about when I'm doing MI is how do I help this, how do I provide the conditions under which this person can come to trust themselves more fully? So for me, there is a very clear sort of, and I, I suppose what concerns me a little bit is that I'm probably, you know, the only people who, who do MI that way are probably me and a small number of people who I've taught, right? Um, and it's an interesting question. Is, is that a helpful theory to have behind my practice? Now, I'm not consciously thinking about that at every moment when I'm doing MI. When I'm doing MI, I'm thinking about engaging and focusing and evoking and, and, and sort of where's the ambivalence and that this person is where are they stuck and how do I help this person tap into their inherent motivation for change? But it's immediately underlay by this idea that that inherent motivation to change comes from this organismic striving, that it's an expression of their self-actualizing tendency. So I think there are many ther therapeutic approaches that don't try to do that, but I think the Rogerian therapy can. I think I saw there's a reference to relational frame theory in, in, uh, in, in the comments, and I think clearly ACT has tried to create a kind of integration of a, of a theoretical model and a set of practices. Now, I'm not an ACT practitioner, so I don't know how, I can't say anything about how well they do that, but I think there are approaches that have tried to do that. And I think there's a, I, th I think it's a val there's a value to it. Although I will also acknowledge the value that everyone else is pointing to of not getting stuck in a si single theoretical lens and not being blinkered, as Bill said, by holding a theory too close and the risks of doing that. And I think there's a dialectical, I suppose, relationship that I want to maintain between those two visions. Yeah, just going back on that point, <clears throat> and it's maybe extending what you well, extended, but talking about CBT a bit, Alan, um, uh, you know, that's my background. And um, I think, you know, Molly's saying, do, do we hold other therapies uh, up in that way? Do we ask them to develop and test theory? And I think the answer is definitely the case. And like you say, uh, relational frame theory is, that's in that world. Uh, I'm not an expert in that either. But I think, you know, it's generally accepted in those worlds that um, the psychotherapeutic approaches uh, have some kind of a theoretical basis for the intervention and that they then test that out. I'm not saying that's necessarily right or MI should do that, but MI has, um, <clears throat> over a period of time, used theory. It was based in theory, as far as I can see, right from the beginning. It's changed constantly. Some people have actually accused it of being theoretically inconsistent or underdeveloped, which is, uh, as I can see from the discussion, is absolutely fine. There's not a problem with that. But certainly, I think holding it up against other psychotherapeutic approaches it does 
it does it does sit to one side and I, I can't decide whether you know that's actually a brilliant thing um and it does give us a lot more options or whether we do actually need to put a bit more energy into theory driven research in, in motivational interviewing and I, I also intensely aware of how that would be influenced by a number of different philosophical perspectives Alan's just articulated his Rogerian bias people would have other ones um, and that's where we'd end up but that's fine you can have all those different perspectives and whether you need to pull them all together into one uh, unified theory or not is um it's a very open question I think somebody could have a go at it I think somebody here could have a go if they wanted to I really like the way Chris explained you know the different levels that he's already thought about that could be underpinning uh any number of explanations why mi works we've we, we know what yeah. they are a lot of them and i think bill summarized them very well at different times you know it's a contrast effect uh it's maybe at some level mitigating imbalances of power in relationships which i think again is something we could develop in mi i think thinking more we don't really operationalize power or how that works in relationships but yet we think of mi as a power yielding approach there's something about the way we talk to people that yields power and if that's the case what do we mean by power and how's that relevant how does that explain why mi seems to work with certain groups of people for example or or works with people who may be a bit more marginalized or or whatever so there's all sorts that can be thrown in there i think it's worth giving it a go personally and i think it's it's quite an exciting idea, but very daunting. And if I could just clarify, I, I'm, of course, every treatment or intervention model needs a theory. I'm, I'm asking the question of a theory that is not an integration and a formulation based on other constructs and ideas that were already in existence. Right. Okay. <laughs> they all have patchworks. I think is my point. Yeah. 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 There were interesting comments in the uh, in the chat about the cross cultural applicability of MI. And one question was, are are there studies showing that it's effective in other cultures? And I think there that's very clearly the case. More recent ones from China and Iran, for example. Uh, so it it seems to be producing effects across very very different cultures. But what does that tell us about theory, or what? How would that inform our thinking about this? I just noticed those comments go by. I think I think one of the things that kind of going back to some of what what Chris and Alan were talking about would be kind of well, is that does that cross cultural convergence have to do with acceptance? Does it have to do with somebody trying to understand? Does it have mm -hmm. to do you know is it is it a more of a spirit effect? than a technical effect um maybe or, or are there some things that are just universal uh for human beings to experience in a positive way and then that we kind of go back more towards the rogerian way of looking at, at, at human and personality and creating you know the um the conditions the necessary and sufficient conditions you know is there is there something to that and in in mi and I've heard Steve talk about, you know, rapid engagement. Is there something about the empathic rapid engagement that happens at the first encounter, the, the first psychological contact um, that puts somebody at ease and lets them sit with conflicting emotions, thoughts, and feelings in a way where they don't have to push one one way or one another way? You know, is, is ambivalence. A core aspect um, of motivational interviewing, if there was a theory, where does that fit in? It sits somewhere between self-perception theory and somewhere between um, cognitive dissonance. You know, because there's a there's just a little gap between those two in and of themselves. Um, I'm sure the people in those different camps would tell me I'm an idiot. And I don't understand if I if I see it that way. Um, but but that's a big piece of it too, you know, that cross-cultural piece. And having trained around the world and in China and Myanmar and Singapore and Malaysia and Indonesia mm -hmm. and, and seeing people 
kind of really resonate to motivational interviewing. And I just kind of wonder what, well, what is it? You know, is it because yeah. I, I train the same across cultures for the most part. It's the same material. Although when they do it in translation, I don't necessarily know what's being said. Um, and I always wondered how you translate double-sided reflection in Mandarin. Um, but um, but there's something there though, Bill. I think there is something that MI taps into that's more about just behavior change and technical and listening and responding to change talk and sustain talk. I keep being struck with this like perception of a kind of impulse to find the right theory. And it's it's something that as I keep listening, I hear it say, well, maybe there isn't one right theory. There's different ways to look at it. And then I hear the conversation drift towards we could do research that would compare and figure out which one's better. <clears throat> and I'm just not so sure about that. Um, Central tendency, nomothetic research, I don't know can really answer kinds of things like is one way of looking at, you know, how we go about this better than another. Um, when each person in each moment, I believe, is different and reacts to things differently. We can get the kind of probabilities, you know, when is it, I'm trying to remember Alan's uh, question earlier, like when to focus on autonomy versus uh, change talk, I think it was in certain settings to the extent we have a, a decent uh, sample, we could say probabilistically, you're probably, you may be better to spend your time on autonomy, but as a practitioner, how does that help me in a moment um, to know a probability that one of the things that I feel like I've gotten most from MI is really in the moment tuning into the person with me and just looking for when does energy go up, when do they open up, when did their eyes light up? When does their voice, you know, get more embodied and less strained? Listening to the words, you know, change talk and sustain talk words and using that as my primary guide more than anything that I walked into the room thinking I knew. And I guess that's part of what underpins for me that I want to know multiple theories because like we were talking about flipping through the lenses or whatever in the moment, let me look at it this way, then look at it that way. Because it's always to me like these puzzle pieces that I'm trying to help somebody fit together. Um, and there are certain things for me, like Alan, the, you know, Rogerian theory is deeply, you know, kind of deep in my bones. So it, it comes to the fore more often than others. But there are simple things that I don't know if they're theoretical based, but like for me, helping somebody find an identity that aligns with positive change or change in, that feels positive to them feels like a key. And I don't know what theory that comes from, but in the moment, having the person, you know, experience it, I will feel better about who I am in my life if I move in this direction, if I make these behavior changes, if I take these new actions, um, seems to be like when we find that, um, things just open up, a channel opens up and they go. And as I think about the various video demonstrations I've seen, like Terry, if you know these, uh, just Sarah one, there's one with Terry Moyers working with a father who's been referred for uh, hitting his child. And to me, like the moment that things really open up is when the father perceives that making changes uh, represents him being a good father and wanting to be an even better father and doing the best for his child, as opposed to the frame that was put in initially, which was kind of a punitive frame of, you know, you're an abusive person and we have to figure out how to get you to stop doing these things, as, which had nothing to do with his why of why they were doing them. It was like an outside in. I realize I'm all over the place. Um, so I'll just stop because I don't think I have a conclusion to that. That sounds like a theory. Right. Yeah, Paul. <laughs> kind of like a theory. <laughs> it does. But and it's interesting in a way, you, you're describing it as something as your experience of the interaction, which I think is absolutely beautiful the way you describe it. Mm -hmm. But you have a theory about what's going on there, why that person is opening up, why that person is 
uh, changing, you know, why they're thinking differently, you know, and those are the mechanisms, I think. Those are the things that, uh, you know, we might be interested in. How, why are people thinking differently? Why are they, you know, why are they emotionally responding in a different way? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's the why question again. And uh, I, I think you can get at it with that description, but I just wonder whether it's easier if you're trying to train people or talk to people about MI to actually have some kind of a theoretical understanding for why you think that is. I mean, I, I certainly find that I, I, I'm not sure where I got it from, but it's kind of I tend to be saying in MI training around mental health that, you know, th this seems to be in some way freeing people up cognitively. Mm. Yeah, that, that comes from all kinds of different uh, uh, sources, but people love that. They go, yeah, that's exactly what's happening. Yeah. And that's really just a theory. Um, so it's I, I, I think how do we move from those descriptions of really good practice and and just seeing what's in front of you to explaining that uh, in a way that we can <clears throat> do? Is there someone not on the panel but who's been participating who'd like to jump in and make a comment or or uh, discuss this a bit? Um, just let us know in the chat. Yeah, let us know in the chat if you'd like to come on up. We'd be more than happy to, to do that. Um, I've been I've been taking the liberty of doing a little chatting back and forth with a, a few of the folks yeah. chatting. Uh, as Joel mentioned, I sometimes like to uh, attention shift. Um, and uh, I do think this this question that this theme arises it, it arose last in our last iteration as well of am I as science am I as art which is not it's not exactly the question of theory but I think I think when we talk about theory it tends to evoke this this discussion and and mm -hmm. I want to say this uh, and and forgive me if uh, uh, it, it evokes the anxiety that underlies that discussion which I think, for many practitioners, um, the idea of what some, that something that we do is, it, it isn't science, but it's sort of science-based or it's an expression of scientific understanding uh, can feel uh, either confining or limiting or, or in some ways um, uh, alienating even. Um, and, we, and I know many practitioners who are wonderful practitioners who have no patience at all for any kind of talk about psychological uh, research on efficacy or theory, um, and 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 you know, I, I for me, it's it's uh, as I tried to express in the comments, it's it's more about um, the science gives us our starting point. It tells us it's better to reflect more often than less often. Nomothetically speaking, you know, generally speaking, right? It's not always going to be the case in every situation. But you're probably, on average, you know, if you if you start off by listening reflectively and affirming and uh, talking less than your client, you're you know you're more likely to establish the kind of relationship you want to establish to help them uh, see the best in themselves than if you did otherwise. Um, so I mean, science in a sense tells us that, research tells us that, but it can't tell us exactly how to do that. Uh, the learning of how to do it, that's craft, whether you call it art or craft, that's skill, apprenticeship, and, and the dedication to one's craft and really taking what you've learned and finding your way of doing it. Sort of, again, the Miles Davis quote that I've loved for many years, which is, it takes a very long time to sound like yourself. You know that Bruno... Bernard wanted to ask a question, so I just asked him to come on up as a panelist. Uh, mm -hmm. He asked a really good question um, earlier. If, do we have any evidence that motivational interviewing as it is as it is today from MI3 is any more effective than it was from MI1? Have, have the adaptions and changes in motivational interviewing made an empirical difference in outcomes? So, Bernie, welcome. You were you you were you were fated to be a uh, to be on. Uh, please turn your camera on if you want and uh, jump in the conversation. Yeah, so nice I to guess, meet you. Yes, nice to meet you as well. So the question that I was thinking about and just kind of trying to pull all of these ideas together, I certainly understand that there's a, a, a 
desire on my part to try and make this cleaner than it is. And I certainly understand the individualistic and kind of using that real-time feedback as I've heard Steve reference in one of the videos before that we're getting from our clients to predict what we do next. But I guess my question was, in some ways, haven't we placed a larger emphasis on self-perception theory with the focus on cultivating change software? And in doing so, I guess my other question is, and partly where I think the example of patchwork in the quilt maybe doesn't adequately address this, this concern I have or the dilemma, is that can we place that additional emphasis on cultivating change thought without it adversely affecting the emphasis on relationship? I, I remember an article uh, from a decade or so ago saying it was titled, Has Motivational Interviewing Fallen Into the Premature Focus Trap? Uh, have, have we spent so much time looking at at change talk? I'm not even sure this was the substance of the article, but but you can get so focused on one piece of it that you stop paying attention to other pieces that are important. Part of the value of these conversations is, you know, hopefully making artic encouraging others and encouraging in ourselves uh, the capacity to articulate you know, other aspects that warrant testing and attention, right? So we first, you know, we observe it, we try and create, you know, a clear lens through which to see it, mm -hmm. and then we're able to test it. Change talk and sustained talk are incredibly testable. <laughs> they are, you know, so that is part of what happens, what happened, I believe, at least in the research is, um, you know, just the, the testability of those hypotheses. But that doesn't mean that other, that other hypotheses or other aspects of the quilt can't be as testable. Um, there's a lot of heartbreak there, I will say, um, without, you know, butchering the study too much. I mean, I, I keep thinking in this conversation about the John Morgenstern study um, where, you know, they compared the sort of pure relational element of motivational interviewing to the um, the motivational interviewing that had more of the um, more of the components of the intervention. So the things like the pros and cons, or you know, and and they both worked equally well. <laughs> so you know, so there's the heartbreak of averages, and there's the you know the 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 argument for looking at moderators or looking at different subpopulations that um, may respond better or worse uh, for different methods. Um, I think I'll just stop there, <laughs> but that's what your question, first you, yeah, that's what your question brings up for me, Bernard. And I, I think I think that also ties back to Chris's point about averages and versus trying to understand individuals. And I think we all intuitively sense uh, e when we're even when we're doing this work that um, we, we don't do the same exact thing, no matter who we, we don't do the same thing with every client. Even if we have a thoroughgoing theory and we're thoroughly sort of grounded in MI and we we don't we, we adjust what we do to different clients based often on what, what might be an intuitive sense of that what this person needs in this moment or what's more likely to reach them in this moment. Um, I, I think there are ways to study that as well. I, I think some of the methods we use, more qualitative and, and phenomenological methods can get at some of those differences in interesting ways to try to really understand, is there something that would tell us what we could then teach again to you know the people we teach about listen for this or look for this. And if you're seeing this or this combination, uh, move more in the direction of autonomy support than cultivating change talk or vice versa, or, you know, or whatever the elements might, might be. And I, I don't think we have that, we don't have that level of sophistication yet, or, or, or sort of like, uh, 
fi- that kind of fine tuning in the research yet. I think we had to start, Molly, where you were talking about with the things that are most studyable. And, and I think it was completely sensible and, and has made an, a huge contribution to focus on, you know, change talk and sustain talk and the relationship between the, you know, the evoking them and, and outcomes. I think what I always, you know, I always hear Terry in my head, which is, you know, and, you know, is that no matter where we are, I feel like Terry's always saying, we've just scratched the surface we're, we're mm-hmm. just getting started uh and and maybe not to be disappointed that we don't know these things in a sense but to be energized by the fact that we don't have answers to these questions yet and how big the field open field still really is for us wow i'd just like i'd just like to echo that because that's something i started off saying at the beginning with um and particularly it was, it, it was the direction I ended up in, in in the research that I did, which was basically pointing me towards a, I, I think, a, 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 there's something about research that is, if you like, more measurable or, or testable that's actually guided it as a way from the client's voice. I mean, I mm-hmm. think, you know, it's, it's very complicated to ask people um, you know, what they think is going on or why this is working. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Uh, and in, in some ways, that's more consistent, I think, with the way MI was developed originally. You know, Bill describes being in being interviewed by uh, a Norwegian psychologists, you know, about what he was saying and what was going on, stopping the session. You know, I think in some ways um, we've kind of we've lost a bit of that. And, and I think in some ways that's it's better suited for answering the why mm-hmm. question. Um, Because if we just focus on outcomes, I think we just become, I don't know, it just closes you off in one direction. And, you know, I I know it's difficult. And I remember having a correspondence with Molly about how difficult it was, you know, in terms of not being able to get the funding and and also uh, research that's carried out in real services and not just efficacy based research. So those are the other elements that perhaps, you know, we can think about. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd like us to do it. But uh, I appreciate how difficult it is, but it's the it's the model of science that drives us in that direction. And I, I think fundamentally for me, that's one of the things that really did worry about how it, 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 it closes down the client and the client's view of things and eliciting from the client. Why am I? Working? So I, uh, this is George, uh, and I just had a brief question and and Bill sort of picked this up in um uh, in one of my chats, uh, I asked the question about uh, does it work cross cultures, and that was my understanding that MI had, was effective across cultures, and and Joel sort of responded as well, which is that I, I know that Joel teaches, and and uh, a million years ago uh, I was in undergraduate uh, philosophy, and that social science testing is just a messy sort. So to try and find a con- consistent theory, I guess the second part of the question, though, Bill, was the um, the theories we're talking about are sort of Western theories, and this culture is, and the and this panel is primarily sort of a uh, Western view of the world. And I'm just wondering if, in your conversations with folks who are native to those other cultures. Um, what they might add to this conversation about what is the theory or what mm-hmm. works behind MI. So that was the second part of the question, because at the forum, I see people coming and talking about this. Mm-hmm. And that was that's that was my question. Uh, uh, Bill and Joel was, you know, what would they say? Dif- what might they say differently if they were here? Mm-hmm. I mean, my own range of exposure is limited, obviously, but I, MI is very Buddhist. I mean, it seems to to fit well with a Buddhist perspective on relationship and and how we are. And I wonder, Joel, what your um, uh, Maori colleagues might uh, be saying about what's going on with this. Native American populations here in the Southwest say that this is most like the way we are with each other. Uh, at home, and so it kind of fits in that way. And in in a pueblo in the southwest, or or native population in the southwest, to come in and tell somebody what's wrong with them and what they should do is psychopathic behavior. I mean, you just 
you wouldn't do that, you know. Uh, so I think we could learn very well from asking the question that George is asking. Uh, Bill, I would, um, you know, having having worked closely with with Maori clinicians and MI trainers and and working with the um, indigenous people um, in Australia, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island uh, people that I've had the the um, the real privilege to work with you get a very similar answer that this this sort of spirit way of being with each other of trying to listen and understand is is what it, it comes natural and then that overlays with you're not coming in and telling us what to do which has been an effect of colonization over the years um if tiffany were here and he were in the audience he could probably speak much more eloquently uh, to it than I could, but I think there's something about that. It's a more natural way of, of being. Um, my some of my experiences in Southeast Asia, and certainly if there we have folks out there as well, is that it's a way of working with people which feels intuitively and naturally normal and right. But a lot of their training is very Western training, and it's very mm -hmm. expert driven. And that's one of the, the biggest challenges some of the physicians and psychologists and health professionals I've worked with is, is kind of the, the, the hierarchy that's naturally in the society just because of who they are and what they bring. And I had a, I had a psychiatrist in Myanmar tell me that if I were to ask the client what they thought the problem was, that I would lose face completely. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to come in and look at them basically, and figure out what's wrong. So I think MI kind of frees people up a little bit to do what feels normal and natural in, in their normal interactions across their life, except when they're in their room or in the, have their uh, jacket on or doing the work that they've been trained to do. Um, and the biggest question I, I typically get in, in Singapore is, our, our patients just want us to tell them what to do. And I say, how does that work? And they say, well, it works for some people, but not others. And I said, okay, well, what do you do? They will tell them what to do again, you know? And so they find, they have found MI to be really helpful when they found a particular place for it. And we, you know, we have a, we have a very active MI group in Hong Kong and in Korea. And, in, and there's not a formal group in Singapore, but there are plenty of MI trained practitioners, and it would be, George, fascinating to ask that question because I, I, you know, because we're trying to unpack it looking through our lens and our experience. Mm -hmm. Yes, what, what do you see happening here? Yeah, mm -hmm. or even how do you explain change in your own language, in your own way? But one thing that I have understood is that every language that I've spoken with people that I don't speak, whether it's um, Mandarin or Cantonese or Malay, they all everybody have words that they use to, to talk about change and not changing as well. And mm -hmm. so, so that's another kind of universal way of doing. They may not use the words that, you know, Put the characters and the words together that we that the Western folks would, but you know they're they're there, and so you can work with it. I wonder, as I'm sitting here rambling and listening to my thoughts, what has, has motivational interviewing really uncovered anything that 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 we that's new that we didn't know by experience before. Or is it just shining a light on things that happen every day and paying a particular attention to it, like how people talk about change? So I, I'm going to jump in very quickly and and Go ahead. because I think that the answer to that question is definitely clearly yes, uh, and at least from the perspective of what was available at the time when I was being trained as a psychotherapist, I was trained in psychodynamically humanistically i also did work in i've done i've done cbt in research studies 
So I've, I've, uh, inter I've done interpersonal therapy. I've done a whole variety. Um, I started off as a purist, ended up as an integrationist. Um, but what, what MI taught me and what I think MI taught the field was that meeting point. Right? You were either a behavior therapist and you prescribed and you know, and you did it, you, you, you let you created exercises, you prescribed activities, or you were a person-centered therapist and you were completely non-directive, or you were a dynamic therapist and you were even more non-directive, but you look for opportunities to interpret unconscious process. And this idea that you are person-centered and directional, client-centered and directive, that you are doing these two things at the same time. Uh, I believe I for certainly it was new to me, and I think it was new. I think it was not something that had been articulated in the way it was articulated by Bill and Steve in in the early days. And I think that for me is what everything else aside is what was uh, what was truly novel. I I would support that. That separating direction from being directive to me was new, is still new, is still you know difficult to keep my head wrapped around in the moment. Um, you know that that I do think that before MI being non-directive meant really have not having much direction in the in the flow, and that that was it's not a bad thing. Not necessarily an efficient thing either, though. I think it's still. I, I think in this was. I mean, I st I think that still is the case, Chris. Right, and I think it's not an accident that now the the meta we heard from Robert Elliott at PCE twenty twenty two that the the meta analyses are beginning to finally show. You know, uh, client centered therapy is sort of less impactful in certain important respects than say CBT which is very disturbing to the person-centered community, but you don't see that in the, I mean, the MI research that's incorporated in those, uh, in those meta now in that meta-analysis is part of what supports the efficacy of client-centered therapy. So I think there's still a lot of directionlessness in, in, in the way person-centered work can be done in the way a lot of so-called dynamic or psychodynamic work is done often badly out there. And I think there's a lot of, still a lot of directiveness telling people what to do those things are still and then we have this third stream i think that that mi sort of represents yeah i was i was uh, i missed the directive scale on the mighty directiveness scale on the mighty i believe it you know because i think it was important at the same time and that's one of the things that struck me like i said earlier was uh, the bringing the bridging the bridging the two opposed ways of being with people and working with people. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, look. Uh, well, wow. Time flies when you're having fun. That's for sure. Um, and we're at it. We're at an hour and a half into this. And um, I'm just gonna ask you, Steve, if there's anything you'd like to share. If you got your audio up and working um, before you take off. Okay. Okay, you're not going to say five more minutes. Right, well, I think he's saying five more minutes. He's st he's still past. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Um, let's just have a just a quick closing round for anybody who would like to just share some thoughts or takeaways or things you're going to be thinking about um, moving forward. I mean, the chat's been great, folks. I, I really we really appreciate it, and it's you know. It's, this is what happens when you get a bunch of uh, interested and in, in, in active people together and try to have a conversation. There's just not enough time. Um, but thank you all for, for jumping in. Um, so let's just go a quick quick round for anybody who'd like to, to, fin to, like to share something. Well, I can say that speaking to the last um, thread of the conversation that I like to say that MI has given two the two great gifts of MI to the field for me are uh, teaching therapists how to be nice to clients and teaching researchers 
and teaching the field how to operationalize a model and train it well. And I think that that is a huge, mm. you know, if we don't, if MI doesn't have a theory, it seems to have done a good job in, um, you know, clarifying what it is and facilitating its teaching to others. I'd also like to say that I think it, it, MI uh, it is theoretically rich. It's, we, it's been based on lots of different theories. We've talked about that. I think it's developed over time and it's still developing. And I actually think it will continue to develop theoretically mm -hmm. because there are people interested in doing it. I'd just like to thank people for talking about this today. It's been really good. People ask me, where do you think MI is going over the next 10 years? And my usual answer is, I have no idea. It's, it's interesting, evolving, growing, morphing um, thing. I think when we, when we wrote each of our chapter, our versions, we had no idea what we were going to see in the next edition. It's quite different each time. So it's, I, I have that sense of an organic thing that is continuing to grow. We, we have done well with understanding how to teach this and, uh, as Molly said, to, to get the model into practice. And that I certainly feel good about. And in, in a way, the book I wrote with Terry uh, raised for me that what we've been doing is talking about how you practice whatever, whatever your model is, whether it's behavioral or doing diabetes education or whatever. There's, there's the interpersonal aspect of it that impacts outcome across all these fields. And really that's where we've been focusing. Can I, can I make a couple of observations? I don't know if you can hear me above. The, hey, we can, yes. The, the sound of cicadas screaming in the heat behind me and various family members prancing around the swimming pool. Um, Two experiences strike me um, that might be fun for you to, to reflect about. One was this idea of, of client-centered and directional. I believe came to us when we, Bill and I were driving back from running a workshop in Santa Fe. And we decided to write a paper on this called What is Motivational Interviewing? And I think that's where we put this idea out. I remember the feeling that I had at the time. I can even remember the road in front of us. Um, and there was a sense of it being more than just client-centered counseling and a, a growing feeling of frustration that, that, was, that came out of an experience in a workshop. I think of people being cozying in a way using a client-centered approach sort of cozying up to somebody and staying cozy and it not having momentum the conversation mm -hmm. and looking back it's that it's that forward-looking sense of momentum while being finely tuned to this person or this group that um is a thing of real beauty and then there's another experience that i had that has completely changed me and it's 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 just beautiful to see both both chris and alan on this call because really it was your um rootedness in client-centered practice that helped me understand that uh, this rigorous pursuit of behavior change which i bought into i think because i was research orientated and this was the way we were defining mi when we made a decision to drop the word behavior and just have the word change, that was extremely liberating. And it was, it was Alan and Chris who were principally responsible for helping me see that. And it, it, it remains that way for me. One other observation, this discussion has, by the way, this discussion has been just so rich because I've had 101 truly bizarre distractions this side. Um, it's been extraordinary. There's a party on the hill opposite us um, with uh, uh, the sound of this party is, is reverberating across the hills here. But I, 
I have this this feeling, and I think Alan knows this and is probably a bit worried about it, I know, and it's a tension between between him and I. I don't sense it between Bill and I, but that the more I look outside of the world of therapy, the more I notice am I familiar processes going on. And and I feel that this is uh, could be a source of tremendous uh, knowledge and wisdom and understanding for me. And so as I leap into the crazy emotional dramas of sport, so do I see the same pitfalls that we've identified in MI and the same promise of better practice, but, but, but being carried out by people who've never heard of MI. And I find this very intriguing. So for me, one future path certainly has to be, or probably will be, trying to understand what it is, not just in from our clients, but from people and parents about what works, because I think there's some new ideas there. Anyway, lots of love to you all, and, and thank you for having me on the call. <laughs> You're more than welcome, Steve. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome to join him to his his uh, webcast. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, so, I heard somebody we know and love once say there are many right ways to do it, and that that's one of those MI things that just always sat with me. And um, you know, for any client, for any person, there's always multiple pathways out of the woods they're stuck in. And you know, I I think for me it corresponds that there are many right ways to see it you know, what we're doing. And I, again, I would just advocate that we keep that uh, appreciation alive and that we keep trying to see this from different perspectives and angles and see if maybe there's another bit that we've missed that's gonna be even more helpful than the bits that have been found so far. Um, and, and the thing that Steve was just saying was kind of the last thing that was in my mind about, it's so much is about momentum and getting out of my head and thinking about what somebody should do and not nearly as important as tuning in looking for those moments and helping somebody get momentum established in whichever direction out of the woods they want to go i'll leave it there thank you mm -hmm. you know one, one of the things that i'll, I'll walk away with is, is is um and then what and one of the things that i've always appreciated about the way um steve and bill and the mi community has kind of been with motivational interviewing. It's, you know, you guys did it kind of get up to the top of the hill, put the MI flag on there and say, here it is and here and thus it shall always be. You know, you didn't die on the hill of having a theory that you had to defend the whole time from people that it's always been a work in progress, you know? And, and you know, I guess that's kind of the way I figure we are as people. Um, but it's always been a work in progress and it's been, you, you've, you've looked, you've welcomed, you know, um, debate and different ways of looking at it. And, and the MI community is so rich across professions that it's not just all clinical psychologists, you know, getting together and doing what clinical psychologists do when they get together, which is kind of frightening to me, but, um, but it, but but it, but a lot of people have different ways of looking at it, and everybody can contribute in their own way. So I think I think that's nice. And the other thing is, is that, um, and I forgot what the other thing was. But that's just the way it goes. So that tells me I need to shut up. All right, Alan, Alan you want to take us out? I feel like I've said my piece and then some, so I don't want to. I, I don't want to. Okay say much more other than to just echo what others have said about really en enjoying this conversation. And in some ways, I suppose I feel like this, this conversation is the is sort of the model, the right kind of model for doing theory, as well as for doing research. It's, it's, um, it's trying out ideas, but not being wedded to them. It's being willing to kind of think off at a different angle and and uh, pick up from someone else thinking off on that angle and seeing where it takes you. And then coming, circling back and seeing if you can put that together in a coherent way that might actually take us a step further. Um, 
And as you said, Joel, I think this is one of the, has always been one of the hallmarks of, of the MI community of, of Mint and the broader MI community is the sort of welcoming of that. And uh, I, it's, a, it's a privilege and, and a joy to be part of. Does everybody have their, their final word for their, of this part of the conversation? Of Paul, of you? Yep. I've kind of lost track of who said what. Okay, well, well on that note, um, this has been grand. And, and I really appreciate everybody's time. Um, and Bill, it's great to see you again. It's been several years, and I look forward to seeing you in Chicago. Um, I have an idea about uh, uh, of doing this um, in Chicago. Um, with you and Steve and a couple other people, so we can um, get on record your story of motivational interview. Um, but we'll talk about that later. I'll send an email out. So anyway, thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks for coming along. I hope people around the world uh, much appreciate everybody um, continuing to join our little funky community of um, MI Geeks. And we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Um, so everybody take care and go with us. Hey everybody. Hi everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Ange.